Welcome back. This is Lesson 8 for How to Compose Music 101, brought to you by ArtofComposing.com. In this lesson, you're going to learn how to put the finishing touches on your completed piece of music. Now, in order to do this, we're going to look back at the final version, but without the analytical marking. Now, up till now, we've talked about writing simple melodies based on chord tones, along with using passing tones and neighbor tones. We've talked about how to use functional harmony to create logical chord progressions. And we've also talked about form. And in particular, this piece here is in small ternary form. But there's clearly more happening on this page. And that's what this final lesson is about. Everything else. Now, our goal here is to create music. And music is normally played by people. Although nowadays, it may be more common to hear a computer performance, we still strive to have real people play our music. And because of this, everything we put on a page should in some way contribute to that. So this lesson is going to be a little bit different from the first seven in that I'm going to just do this in real time on the computer and make some changes to this piece. So let's get started. So I have a few guidelines that I like to think about when I'm trying to finish off a piece so that it's presentable to other people. Um, you know, first thing that I like to do is make sure that I've got all of the basics down on the page. So, you know, things like having a title, having a copyright, making sure your name is on here as the composer. Um, those are the kind of things that, you know, let people know who's written the music and what they can kind of expect from it. You know, with a title like Bagatelle Number no. 1, chances are it's going to sound like a short classical piece. If it's Symphony Number no. 1, you're going to expect something different. Um, and then probably uh, the more important things are the tempo markings. Now, um, I like to put both, you know, a word like Allegro and an actual uh, beats per minute here because it, it really gets rid of the ambiguity on the tempo. If you were to just put Allegro, then it doesn't guarantee that somebody's going to play it at the tempo that you imagined it. Now, you may want that. You may want a little bit more variety with uh, interpretation from different, different uh, performances. However, most of the time when you hear something in your head, that's exactly how you want it to be performed as well within reason. So that's why I like to put a real beats per minute. Another thing is you want to make sure that you've got uh, bar numbers here. Now for a, a short classical piece like this at the beginning of the system is fine, but um, it is common to put more bar numbers like over every bar, especially if this is for production, like you're recording for a film or something like that. Another thing you want to think about is the actual size of the notation. So in most notation programs, you can choose the size of the staff. I can make it smaller like this, but when you make it smaller, it becomes difficult to read sometimes, uh, depending on how far away the, uh, the person is from the page or, you know, maybe their eyesight's not very good. So I like to go up uh, a little bit larger, you know, around um, 0.28 inches or so. Uh, there are some standard sets of sizes, but generally you just want to make sure it's big enough to read. Now from here, the next thing that I'm concerned with is that the form of the piece kind of jumps off of the page. Um, now let me explain what I mean. If, if we're looking at this piece of music right now, it's not very clear just by looking at it what's going on. Now you can try to hum through the melody, you can try to figure it out from dynamics and stuff, but really the way we shape the page can do a lot in terms of how somebody interprets the music. And let me show you here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start aligning these uh, bars so that they're on one system, meaning that they just go across on one line on the page, so that it actually matches the form of the piece. And in this case, I know that I've got a, uh, a four-bar phrase here as this first one. So I can select all of these bars, and I can put them on one line or one system. What this really does for me is that looking at you know four bars in one system, I can clearly delineate the phrase. It starts here, it ends here, and then this is the upbeat to the next phrase. Um, if I were to not follow this rule, let's say I wanted to put eight bars, um, or you know, let's do something odd like seven bars. It just looks, well, for one, this looks really cluttered, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, but you know, let's do something small. Let's do three bars. It doesn't really help with interpretation. Maybe I think, oh look, you've got a crescendo there to the forte, and then it looks like an upbeat there. Maybe it's just a three-measure phrase. So 
ultimately what we want to do what we want to do is we want the music to just jump off the page to the person playing it so I'm gonna continue going through here and I'm going to do this for the different phrases now with um, with the contrasting middle it's a little bit different if I were to do the entire contrasting middle to me that's a little bit bunched up so um, I'm gonna break it up we could do maybe these first three like that or that that even looks a little odd maybe something like that this these are kind of busy bars here and these are a little bit less busy so um, ultimately we want to turn that into as readable as possible and you can see when I've done this now I put it on one page instead of two pages so it's instantly a little bit easier to read um, in fact I could probably decrease the size of it a little bit and uh, I think that is looking pretty good what that really does for us once again is I look at this that's a phrase I look at this that's a phrase you've got uh, this whole section that's kind of standing on its own and then you've got this last phrase at the end to use a program called Sibelius which is a music notation software and uh, if you're using Sibelius it has a couple features that that can really help um, that I think everybody every composer should be using um, so some of these features are for instance the optimized staff spacing which is under the layout tab and what this does is if your spacing is a little bit messed up it kind of resets everything so if I select it all click optimize you can see everything jump back into place uh, the other one is under the appearance tab it's called reset note spacing and then once again if you add uh, or if your spacing on your notation is kind of all out of whack it will re-space it so that it's spaced properly um, beyond this you know just using the layout features so you can turn things uh, into one single system and that's what I was doing here uh, where I make it into a system um, you can also lock things on the page so that I could lock that make that into a page and then any new bars that I create after that go on to the next page um, so so those are just some of the features that I think everybody needs to be thinking about and if you've got finale or muse score or you know any other notation software it probably has similar features that you could be using now after thinking about the way you shape your your page by how many bars are in a system um, you can also look at adding some other features to clarify the form um, one great thing you can do is add proper bar lines now here obviously we're kind of limited we have repeats um, so the repeat is is going to very clearly delineate one section here the exposition and then the contrasting middle and the recapitulation have their own repeat um, but if you don't have repeats in yours you can use the double bar line that's always a great thing to use to break up the form and uh, you don't want to overuse it you don't want to have a double double bar line every four or eight bars but it is something that you can use you know for large sections so there are other ways that we can clarify the form um, and one of the best ways to do this is through contrast that we create with our music the best way to do this is with texture dynamics and articulation so let's talk about each one of those now first off texture is how thick or thin the music feels um, it's not really an exact science you know sometimes uh, you would think like having a bunch of notes is going to necessarily feel real thick but that may not be the case for instance down here if we have something like that it, it feels pretty thick that's got four notes but if we were to play four notes up real high well that didn't sound very good that feels still really thin a lot of it has to do with the overtones that are being excited um, but you know we can have still a heavy texture down at the bottom with very few notes versus having a bunch of notes up high and if you look throughout the piece you can see that I like to vary the texture uh, quite a bit so in this opening bar we've got a uh, relatively thick chord with a melody in the soprano it sounds like this Um, and as the bar or as the phrase continues the texture starts to uh, move a little bit thinner you've got this chord that's moving up in its range the melody's moving lower down and then uh, in this third bar here it thins out to only two voices 
um, when finally in the last bar the, you've got mm. just a single note in the bass and then now chords in the melody. So you can see that each bar is really uh, changing kind of drastically the, the texture that we're using, but it does help to shape the phrase, especially once we go back to the original texture in bar six. So let's hear this. Now, as we get on to the contrasting middle section, I basically have one texture that I use throughout, which in itself gives it contrast from the exposition, which had many different textures. Here I'm, I'm hitting a pedal in the bass, and I've got a melody that's in thirds or, you know, harmonized with one other voice. So let's hear how this sounds. And then finally, as you get down to the bottom here, I've done something special with the melody. So it, you can see it's harmonized with only one other voice, but it's harmonized in a very special way. Um, let's listen to it real quick. Now this sound, you may have heard before and you're not sure exactly what it's called. Um, it goes by the name of horn fifths, and it sounds like this. It's got that very regal, majestic sound. And there's a history behind this. Originally, um, horns were only able to play on one single overtone series at a time. They didn't have their chromatic valve system that they have now. Um, and so if you wanted them to play in harmony, it would end up doing something like this. Uh, just because that's all they could do. If they wanted to change key, they actually had to change the tubes on the horn, pull something out, and put something new in to be in a new key. Um, but, but what this has led to is that people really like that sound because it was used so often, especially in the classical period. And then finally, this last bar, or the last two bars here, I change it up a little bit and I, I double up the bass to give it a little bit thicker texture. So let's hear that. You know, there's no confusion that that's the end of the piece. It's, you know, a little bit wider spaced. You've got the double octaves in the bass, and you've got the chords in the right hand. So, so that's what I'm doing with the texture. Um, the next one is dynamics. Now, dynamics are another great way to shape the feel of the piece. As you can see, I start with a mezzo forte here, and then I drop it down to piano, and then it moves back up now to forte in this last uh, last bar of the first phrase and then I kind of repeat that. What this does once again is help shape the form, help shape the piece. Um, I create more contrast in the middle here by just keeping mezzo forte throughout and then at the end I change it up finally with the forte throughout the entire recapitulation uh, moving up to a fortissimo right at the end and it just once again it kind of signals that oh this is the end. Finally we get to the articulations. Now with articulations I like to look at these as more the small scale so I'm not really as concerned with the entire theme or the entire phrase. Um, I'm more concerned with how each bar in each idea sounds as a complete unit within itself. Um, now on a piano you're, you're limited somewhat on your articulations versus if you're composing for say a violin or you know a woodwind which has quite a bit more control over the individual note but you do have differences be, you know, between having um, staccato notes or legato notes or hitting it really hard or hitting it really soft uh, for instance Those all sound pretty different in their effect. Um, so as you can see here, I, I get real detailed. I, you know, da, da, da. I want this note to be short here. Um, and then in the next phrase, I've got the two staccato notes over the eighth notes. It's just giving itself a little bit of variety. Um, a lot of it has to do with how much listening that you've done 
to great music because great composers end up performing a lot and hearing their music played and making changes as they go along. And so you can absorb that by listening to lots of music. You understand how phrasing works, when staccato notes are going to be appropriate, when legato notes are going to be appropriate. And the fact is, most music can handle lots of different articulations and a lot of different stylings on it. So a lot of times, just play around with it. See what it sounds like if you've got a staccato or slurred or legato or any other type of articulation that you can handle. So that basically does it for the details. We've taken care of you know, all the required stuff on the page. We've set up the, the system so that they you know, make the form pop. We've controlled the texture of the piece and the dynamics and the articulations so that it all clarifies the form and it helps a player interpret the music in the way the composer wants it to sound. So let's listen to this one last time and just really try to listen to the to the way every element is helping to shape the form of the piece. Okay, so that does it for the free beginner's composing course from artofcomposing.com. Um, if you want to sign up and get the worksheets for this, head on over to artofcomposing.com slash free. You can sign up there and you'll get an email that takes you to the course page where I've got you know links to all these different videos and you get the worksheets plus a little bit of extra definitions and things like that. Um, I hope you enjoyed the course. If you did, head on over to artofcomposing.com and also, if you're interested in something a little bit more in-depth, head on over to academy.artofcomposing.com where I have a much longer, fully featured uh, Music Composition 101 course. It goes over a lot of the same concepts, but it's about eight hours long, so it's a much more in-depth college-level type course where I talk much more about harmony, more about creating melodies, about adding accompaniment to your piece. Um, we get real in-depth on form. And uh, it's just a great place to learn how to compose. So I will see you there. Until next time.